Thanks, guys. Whoever, whoever thought of doing that song right there, I love you. <laughs> you may be asking the question, you're probably asking the question, why this series? Why a series on marriage here at 722? Why a series on marriage at a, at a single adult Bible study? I'm going to tell you why. Several reasons, not the least of which is this. I'll never forget the first time I preached a series of messages on marriage. Um, I, I don't even remember how old I was, but for the longest time I just felt like it was something that I, I wasn't qualified to deal with. I hadn't been married long, long enough to deal with it, so it took a while before I got around to doing that. After I preached that series on, message, uh, series on marriage, married people were coming up to me, and some divorced people were coming up to me, tears streaming down their faces, all saying the same thing. I wish I had heard this 20 years ago. And every time I talked about it, every time I dealt with the subject, every time I dealt with the issue, married people and some divorced people would come up to me and say, I wish somebody would have told me those things before I got married. So then I decided after that, well, maybe, maybe every once in a while when I'm with folks, you know, single adults and people who are on their way there, because statistically, the majority of you in this room will be married in a relatively short period of time. Now, for some of you, you hear that and you go, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> for others of you, you're doing all you can right now not to just get up and shout. <laughs> Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. I'm claiming that one right there. If the brother doesn't say anything else, I'm all over that one. Statistically, we know that, that the majority of you will be married within a relatively short period of time. Statistically, we also know that unless you do something differently than it's being done right now, no more than half of you will stay married. Don't let that one pass you by. Statistically, if the statistics in our culture bear out, the majority of the people in this room, under the sound of my voice right now, will be married in a relatively short period of time. And statistically, if you do things the way we normally do them in our culture, no more than half of those who get married will stay married. That's why this is important. Because in many instances, we don't even know what we're aiming for. And it's kind of hard to hit what you're not aiming for. Another reason is, my wife and I got married my sophomore year in college. I had just turned 20. And a lot of times people hear that and they're like, oh man, I just, 20 years old, I just, man, you know, 50 years ago, that was the norm. 50 years ago, people would have been looking at me like, 20? What's up, man, what were you waiting on? <laughs> you know? Again, today I know the average age is somewhere around 28 for men and a little bit younger than that for women, but we got married my sophomore year in college. I was 20 years old. I had just turned 20. I met her January 21st, 1989. We got married six months later, June 30th, 1989. Oh, I knew what I wanted. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. Had our first baby 10 months later. <laughs> we were what you call efficient. <laughs> last two generations, my side of the family, my wife's side of the family, last two generations, all of our siblings, our parents, and all of their siblings, last two generations, 25 marriages, 22 divorces. And so we walked into that situation realizing that we didn't know, we didn't understand, we didn't have what we needed in order to make it in this life of marriage if we were just going to look at what had come before us. So we had to have something else. And, and I, I would venture to say that's probably where most of you are. Most of you, maybe not, you know, the, the statistics maybe aren't that scary in your family, but for most of you, you're looking at your family and you're looking at your, your, your siblings and you're looking at the people around you and your friends and all this stuff and you're looking at them and you're going, okay, I want to do everything that they didn't do. Amen? But here's the problem. 
unless we have a standard, we're just making it up as we go along. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what that standard is. And here's what it's going to do for you. There's two things that happen a lot of times when I deal with this subject matter. One is there are people in the audience who quit playing and get married. You can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. Usually that happens. There are people in the audience who say, you know what? We've been messing around. We've been just playing for a long time. It's time to stop playing. time to get married. Second thing that happens, and I'm probably more excited about this, there's people who break up. Why would I be excited about that? I'll tell you why. The first couple I ever married should never have been married. I counseled with them. I spent two hours with them. And I came away saying, you two probably shouldn't go through with this. They got angry with me. It was my sister-in-law. I had only been married a couple of years to my wife. So I was like, you know what? I'm probably not going to die on this hill right here. I'll do y'all's wedding. I did their wedding. They lasted two years. They got divorced. Broke my heart. It broke my heart. I, I mourned. I, mo- I wept when they got divorced. And all of a sudden, I was like, God, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm I'm sorry. I wish I could have stopped that before it happened because it should not have happened. And there may be some of you in this room walking straight into a situation like that, but if you don't have a standard and you don't understand what marriage is about, you, you don't know that. You just know that you like the way you feel when you're around this person. Help you. And so what we're going to do is, tonight we'll look at Genesis 2, and we'll just get a bird's eye view of what this thing we call marriage is all about. After that, we're going to spend our time in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6, um, looking at what the Bible says about the roles of husbands, the roles of wives, and looking at what it says about the family and, you know, children and things of that nature and what we do with our children and what our goals ought to be in that regard. We're just going to look at these things straight out of the Scriptures and just let the Bible say what it says. And as we do that, my prayer for you and my challenge to you is that you would take whatever it is that you're holding on to right now and you would just measure it against what the Scripture says. Because I believe if we do that, it will completely transform the way we view our relationships. It will completely transform um, you know, the, the way we think about you know, marriage in general, it'll completely transform the way we relate to married people around us and pray for married people around us. It'll completely transform what it is that we think we're looking for. Because it's one thing to know what you like. It's another thing to know what you need. With that in mind, open your Bibles with me. Genesis chapter 2. I love Genesis. It's all the way on the left. I don't assume anything. Genesis chapter 2, beginning of verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. Just pause right there. How smart do you think Adam had to be to name all those animals? I used to think about that. I mean, how many animals could you just sit down and somebody just bring them in front of you and say, you decide what they're going to be called? I'd run out of stuff, you know? That's four-footed crawling thing. (laughs) That's slightly larger four-footed crawling thing. (laughs) Just a thought. (laughs) The man gave names to the cattle, to the birds of the sky, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon him, and he slept. 
Why? So he wouldn't mess it up. <laughs> then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. I love that. Adam, God just made. Eve, he fashioned. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jesus. All right. And the man said, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Beautiful passage of Scripture. I want to lift from this several principles about marriage. The first is this, that marriage was God's idea. Marriage was God's idea. It's not something that Adam thought up. It wasn't even something that Adam was aware of. It was God's idea. God said in verse 18, it is not good for the man to be alone. Think about that for a moment. Every day in creation, God says two things. Let there be and it is good. Every day. Day one, let there be, it is good. Day two, let there be, it is good. Day three, let there be, it is good. Day four, let there be, it is good. Day five, let there be, it is good. Day six, let there be, it is good. All the way through, two things. Let there be, it is good. First time he says something is not good is when he looks at the man by himself. It is not good. For the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Marriage was God's idea, not man's idea. And so if marriage is God's idea, then it's something that we need to think about God's way. And it's something that we need to do God's way. It's not something that we invented. It is something that God ordained. It is the first and the foundational institution that God gave to us. Three institutions he gave to us. Marriage and the family, the church and government. The family is foundational to the other two. Marriage and family is the foundation upon which all other institutions are built. It was God's idea. That means it's a good thing. Amen. You, you want to get crossways with me? Here's, here's how you get crossways with me. And you're not married in here, then you probably can't do this. But you want to get crossways with me, here's what you do. You be a man who's married to a woman and talk bad about marriage. Oh, we'll get crossways real fast. Yeah, the old ball and chain. See, see, see that right there? That's one of them right there. Well, you know, I used to have fun, then I got married. Marriage is a good thing. Marriage is a beautiful thing. I wish I was born married. <laughs> and one of the things that I always prayerfully consider is the words that come out of my mouth about something that God created. And I don't ever want to talk down about something God created. You don't want to get married? Bless you. But don't talk bad about something God created. It is a beautiful thing. It was God's idea. By the way, it's God's idea before the fall. So it's not something that was sort of thought up after everything went haywire. It was God's idea before the fall. It is a beautiful thing. It is a pure thing. It is a holy thing. It's awesome. Don't talk bad about it. If it's not something that you've been called to, man, Bless you. Keep on stepping. But don't talk bad about something God created, especially when you understand why. Look at the next part of the passage. I will make him a helper suitable for him. That's interesting. Marriage is God's idea, which means that the purpose for marriage or purposes for marriage must also come from God. And I've heard a lot of people talk about the purposes of marriage. And a lot of them come straight out of whatever, our selfish, egocentric, narcissistic culture. 
There are two basic biblical purposes for marriage. I used to think there were four, but I realized that two of them were subsets of the other two. Two basic purposes. Purpose number one, procreation. Amen. Have babies. Have lots of them. That was purpose number one. By the way, the text says, I will make him one to come along and be his corresponding part. I will make him one to come along and complete him. I will make him one to come alongside him so that he can accomplish what it is that I have him to accomplish that he can't accomplish on his own. Well, was she to help him name the animals? Nope, he did that all by himself. Was she there to help him tend the garden? Nope, doing that one all by himself. One thing, however, that brother was not going to figure out all on his own. <laughs> there were not going to be any babies if Adam didn't get Eve. Procreation is one of the purposes. And by the way, by procreation, here's what I'm talking about. Don't sell this one short. Because the idea is not just that we would bring children into the world. But the idea is that we would bring children into the world and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So the idea is that we would spread the image of God throughout the earth. That we would subdue the earth. That we would conquer the earth. That we would go as far as we can individually. And that through our descendants extend even further than we can physically extend ourselves. That's what it's about. And our children are a blessing and an inheritance from the Lord. You won't get crossways with me again? Talk bad about the babies. <laughs> Talked to a guy who had three kids. He told me his last kid, third kid, was named Miney. Miney? Yep. Eeny, meeny, and miney. We ain't having no more. Isn't that interesting? And I just asked him. I said, brother, if your boss came to you three times and gave you a raise and blessed you and gave you a promotion and blessed you, and then he walked up to you a fourth time and tried to give you a raise and a promotion and bless you, would he say, would you look at him and say, hold on, brother, I know why you're coming. You have already blessed me three times. Don't you give me another raise or another promotion. He said, no, I wouldn't. He said, interesting. The Bible says your children are a blessing and an inheritance from God. But you say to God, no thanks. Our attitude toward children burdens me. My wife and I had two children early on in our marriage, and then we bought the lie. We listen to people in our family. We listen to people in our culture who said to us, you have a daughter, you have a son, you have all together now the perfect little family. We believe that. We decided that we wouldn't have any more kids. We decided that we would tell God, God, you're through. I stood there and I watched as my son was born and the doctor went in and tied my wife's tubes. Several years later, she walked up to me, tears running down her face. And she said, Vody, I need you to forgive me for something. I said, what? She said, I denied you more children. And that was wrong. I said, baby, I was right there. She said, listen, just I need you to hear me on this. You forgive me? I said, yes, I forgive you. She said, if you forgive me, then will you take me to the doctor so we can get this undone? I said, yeah. And she said, it'll cost about $10,000. I said, baby, why did you do that? <laughs> we go to the doctor, and we find out that they can't undo what was done. It was terrible. They couldn't undo what was done. 
We were getting all excited about God blessing us with some more babies. They couldn't undo what was done. What's worse? We also found out about some other medical issues that my wife had that eventually put her life in jeopardy. She almost died. But God healed her. And God also birthed in us an unquenchable desire for more babies. So what were we going to do? We walked into an adoption agency a little over two years ago, and we said, you know what? We'd like to adopt three or four babies from you over the next few years, if that's okay. <laughs> Ma'am, are you all right? She said, yeah, I, I thought you just walked in here with them two big old kids of yours who feed themselves and clothe themselves and said you want three or four babies over the next few years. I said, yes, ma'am, that's what we said. Ma'am, where are you going? <laughs> she comes back in with her supervisor. She says, tell her what you just told me. I said, ma'am, we'd like to adopt three or four children over the next few years, if that's okay with you. Lady asked us why. My wife looked at her and said, we just don't have enough babies. <laughs> Ma'am, are you okay? <laughs> they just told us right there, we love you. 16 months ago, little Elijah came home. And any day now, we're expecting baby number four. Most incredible thing in the world. Because we understand something. We understand that our life is about more than just us and our satisfaction and our desires. Our life is about more than just getting all we can and canning all we get and sitting on the can. And that when it comes to an end, we want to be able to look out there at a house full of ballistic missiles who have been fully trained to be launched into this lost, hurting, and dying world that desperately needs for us to have a whole bunch of babies and train them in righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Second purpose, illustration. Illustration. Procreation illustration a living example of the relationship between Christ and the church. That's what we're going to spend much of our time on over the next few weeks. That picture in Ephesians chapter 5 of the husband and the wife being a living illustration of the relationship between Christ and the church. Now, if I believe that marriage is all about me and my happiness, then when I'm not happy, I walk. And I've heard this so many times. I, I'm just, I'm leaving. Why, why are you leaving? Because I'm just not happy anymore. Well, Get un unhappy. Well, I just don't believe that God would want me unhappy. Two purposes for marriage in the scriptures, your happiness is not one of them. Suck it up and go work it out. <laughs> if I look at it selfishly, that's what happens. When I'm not happy anymore, when I'm not satisfied anymore, when I'm not fulfilled anymore, I'm ready to walk. But if I understand that our marriage is an illustration a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church, then I understand that I am here for the long haul. I tell my wife all the time, girl, you leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> An illustration of the relationship between Christ and his church. This changes everything, folks. This changes what we look for in a mate, doesn't it? I mean, if I'm just looking for, you know, somebody who just looked real good, by the way, Two things about people who look real good. Number one, they don't stay that way. <laughs> I used to be skinny. <laughs> Number two, they don't stay that way. There's so many more important things in life than that. And I met several people 
who have been willing to completely compromise on the more important things because somebody looked good. And whenever anybody around them would point out the fact that there were so many more important things that were missing in this individual, they accused them of being jealous because that person looked so good. <laughs> Again, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. There's so much more than that. If we understand that it's about procreation and a godly line, if we understand that it's about illustration and us being a living, breathing example of the relationship between Christ and his church, it completely changes what we look for. Thirdly, look at what he says. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man and said to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper, a helper suitable for him. Here's the deal. Third principle we learn, God's the one who causes us to desire marriage. Adam didn't know that he was alone. He, he, he didn't know what alone was. He had no idea that he needed a corresponding part. God's the one who made him aware by giving him an assignment. And so all of a sudden, God says, Adam, I want you to name the animals. And Adam starts naming the animals, and something funny happens. Adam sits there, he goes, he goes, okay, that, that right there, that's a gorilla. That's a he-gorilla and a she-gorilla. The crocodiles right there, alligators right behind them. They're different, their heads are the different size right there. Yeah, right. And he alligator and she alligator. And he crocodile and she crocodile. That's the elephant right there. And he elephant and she elephant. God, everybody got somebody, I don't like none of them. He didn't even know until he named the animals. God is the one who awakens in us a yearning and a desire to be married. You know what's sad? There's so many people in our culture who treat that like it's a sin. You want a husband. You want a wife. People say, well, you're just not very spiritual. If you were more spiritual, you'd just pray and you'd be satisfied. help you. <laughs> God made that boy want a wife. I've been there. Told you. Met her January 21st, married her June 30th. Only reason I waited until June 30th is because she wanted her family to be there. If it wasn't for that, we got married and then showed up and said, here we are. People ask all the time, you know, why? Why did you do that? Because I hear this stuff, you know, these people who are, you know, these two-year engagements. Because somewhere in the book of Second Hesitations, it says that you have to, <laughs> you got to graduate from college, you know. It says you got to graduate from college before you get married, you know. So you have these people, you know, it's sophomore year, and they're supposed to be all in love, and, you know, and they say they're going to get married, and they have this, like, two-and-a-half-year engagement. Something wrong with that, man. That... That's not right. What? Here's the deal. I wanted her. Do you hear me? I wanted that woman. And I was like, people were like, well, you need to wait till you graduate from college. I ain't going to make it. Mm. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. Me being engaged to her that long, I mean, that'd be like going shopping without any money. Either I leave frustrated or I take something that doesn't belong to me. Those are my only two choices, man. If you can fix your mouth to say, let's wait two and a half years, you probably don't need to be married. Uh-uh. No. Whoo, man. Bless you. Here's the deal. The strongest man in the Bible, the wisest man in the Bible, and the most godly man in the Bible all fell into sexual immorality. For me to try to wait to marry Bridget would have been for me to ask myself to be wiser than Solomon, stronger than Samson, and more godly than David. And I am not. So we got married in six months. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
Now, it's not for everybody. <laughs> but it was for me. <laughs> and here's what had happened. God had birthed in me a desire for a mate. And I knew what I wanted. I was praying. I had a list of stuff. And we're going to talk about that over the next couple of weeks. This list of stuff. And I'm like, Lord, I just, here's the deal. This is the stuff. This is the non-negotiable stuff right here. I have looked in your word, and this is what it says a godly woman ought to look like. These are the non-negotiable things right here. On the back, that's just some stuff that if you love me a whole lot, just please, can I just <laughs> add that too right there? Now, I don't have to, but, you know, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. So I'm putting like a whole list of stuff over there on the back, you know. I meet this woman, and she is all that in a bag of chips. She is, she's things that I didn't even have sense enough to ask for, okay? And I, I, I meet her, and I go back, and I'm like, God, please don't be teasing me. Please, because I... <laughs> that night, I told my roommate I met the woman I was going to marry. Soon. And we did. I'll never forget that night. January 21st, I walked up to her. We were at a dance. I walked up to her, smooth. <laughs> I mean, I, it, was just, it was just smooth. I asked her to dance again, smooth. She said no. <laughs> I had her right where I wanted her. But here's the interesting thing. God had awakened in her the same desire and the same yearning. Marriage is God's idea. He's the one who determines its purpose. And he's the one who creates in us a yearning for it. Don't you dare go around being ashamed because you want what God designed you for. Don't you dare go around apologizing because you agree with God when he says, it's just not good for that boy right there to be alone. Amen? Next, look at the next part of this passage. So the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. The Lord took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord got fashioned into a woman, the rib which he had taken from the man, and brought her to the man. Look at this. The man said, this is now. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Th that first phrase right there, you know, I was kind of joking when I said, mm, mm, mm. In the Hebrew, it's not far off. He was happy. When a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. I want you to know that God desires to give you the best. Here's the problem. We have no idea what that means, the best. Our culture says the best is the one with the right degree from the right school so that he will have the right job, so that I can live in the right house, in the right neighborhood. Our culture says the best is the girl who just looks like, you know, that. So that all my friends will say, oh man, oh man. That's what the world says, and we think that's the best. But when you understand what the purposes of marriage are, the best sounds completely different, and it looks completely different. But when you understand who you are and what you need, when you understand the desires that God has given you, and all of a sudden you open your eyes one day, and you realize that he has put you to sleep and fashioned exactly what you need, exactly what you desire, and more than you could ever have asked for. You come to a place where you realize that marriage is a gift to you from God. That doesn't mean that he loves, you know, people who are married more than people who are not. Jesus, for example, talks in Matthew chapter 19 very clearly about people who are eunuchs for the cause of the kingdom, individuals who are, who are called upon and who are gifted to not have need of marriage, shall we say. But they're the exception and not the rule. And we're not saying that they're less loved by God. That's not the point at all. 
But if God places in you that desire, and then he gives you exactly what you need to meet that desire from a biblical perspective, it's a good thing, and it is an incredible gift from God. Marriage has not always been easy for me, but it's always been good. It is a gift from God, even in the most difficult days that he uses to shape me and mold me. Marriage has chiseled away at me and has made me a better man. The difficult days, the difficult days, I wouldn't trade my worst day with Bridget for a dream date with Tyra Banks or Halle Berry or Tyra Banks and Halle Berry. Because <laughs> she's a gift to me from Almighty God and she's exactly what I need. Look at the last part of this. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they two shall become one flesh. The man and the wife were, were both naked and unashamed. This is wonderful. This talks about how the marriage relationship transcends all other relationships. For this cause, a man will leave his mother and his father. I love my mama, and I love my daddy. I didn't always know my father. I love him. And I do. I love my mother. But I didn't understand the significance of marriage until I realized that I had met someone for whom I was willing to say, Mama, I love you and I'm grateful to you, but I'm going to live with her. <laughs> this relationship transcends all relationships, it transcends my relationship with my boys. You know, I remember when I was single, it was my boys, man. And all of a sudden, you know, when I got married and, you know, the guys were all, oh, man, you used to, you used to hang out, you used to do this, you used to do all that, then you got married, and then I said, stop right there. Back up. Then I got married. I don't want to be with y'all no more. <laughs> I mean, I love you and everything, but I found something better. And I'll see you every once in a while, and I'll, I'll pray for you. May even go do something with you here and there. But I found something a whole lot better. It transcends all of the relationships. And until you found that individual, you haven't found the person that God's called you to marry. You find somebody that's just kind of all right. You're not there yet. This is the crucial one. This is the most important one. How important is this relationship? How important is the marriage and the family to God? You know what's interesting? Among those who would lead God's church, there are two requirements. Two requirements of an elder or pastor. Just two. There's a lot of character issues that have to be there, but two skills, I should say. Not two requirements. Two skills. One skill is to be able to teach. The other to manage a household well. You know what's interesting? If I take all of my degrees and my training for ministry and stack them up over here, and I take my marriage to Bridget, and my role as the father of Jasmine and Trey and Elijah and baby next and next and next and next, this pile's way up higher than that. There's nothing more important. You want to know who I am? The place to find out who I am is in my relationship with my wife and my children. That's where you really know who I am. You want to know who I'm becoming? You look at my relationship with my wife and my children. You want to know where my flaws are? You ask my wife and my children. Because there are things that I can hide from any and everybody that can never be hidden from them. That's why those relationships are so important. So incredibly meaningful. 
there are several things that I've asked God for over the course of my life. I, I never forget, you know, when I was younger, I just, you know, I just wanted people to just remember me as a ball player. Here lies Vody Bakum. The boy could play. And then I kind of matured a little bit, you know. Maybe here lies Vody Bakum. The boy could play. And he was smart too. <laughs> a little picture of a guy with the Heisman pose, you know, graduation cap on. I've come to a place in my life where there's just a few things that I ask God for. And one of them that I pray for regularly is that God would allow me to spend my last day, last day on this earth with my wife so that I could look her in the face and tell her that I was faithful to her till the day they put me in the ground. And another thing that I asked for is that I was raise my children in such a way that after I'm done scratching and clawing and fighting for the cause of the kingdom, and after I have reached out as far as I could possibly go for the sake of Christ, that I would have raised my children in such a way that rather than pursue the things of this world, they would climb over me and pick up where I left off and go further and further and further than I could ever imagine or that I could ever have gone in and of myself. That's what I want. More than anything else in this world, that's what I want. And my prayer for you is that you would not buy the lie of this culture that sees marriage as a merger. That you would not buy the lie of this culture that says it's temporary. That you would not buy the lie of this culture that says that it's just about you being satisfied and comfortable. That you would not buy the lie of this culture that says that it's just about you finding the prettiest person that you could possibly find and stare at them until they don't look so pretty anymore. But that you would grab a hold of this concept that God desires to use you for his glory and for his honor and that part of that may include that he would bring one alongside you who would send you along further than you could have ever gone by yourself and with whom you can bear and raise children who come to know and serve the Lord and go on even further still. Don't buy the lie. The truth is so much more gratifying, so much more satisfying, so much more real. For some of you in this room, you may need to just go and reassess where you are, what you've been looking for, what you've been after, and take a few steps back. Others of you in this room, you may need to just wake up and smell coffee and realize that whatever it is that you've been waiting for, when you read Second Hesitations, and you think you've got to have a six-figure income and a 401k before you get married, man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that first part of our marriage. We were, we were po. Not poor, we couldn't afford the other O and the R, we was just po. <laughs> and it was good. I told some of you before, I, you know, I was a student athlete, I was on a football scholarship. And I didn't know that there was an NCAA regulation that said I couldn't have a job during the season. So during the season, my wife and I had to live on $324 a month. I can eat that all by myself. But when the two of us sit and reminisce about the good days, those days are always included. You know why? Because we found out that the money, the success, the mortgage, those are not the things that constitute the good days. 
The good days are when we look one another in the eye and each of us knows the other's not going anywhere and that there's no place that either of us would rather be. My prayer for you is that God would give you that. That he would bless you with that and that you'd receive it with open arms and that you would rejoice in it and you'd speak well of it and that you'd hold on to it for dear life like it was the most precious thing that you'd ever been given. Because newsflash, just about is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege that you've given us to be in your presence and among your people the opportunity we've had to enter into this two-way conversation that we call worship, to say some things to you and about you that we know and believe to be true and to anxiously anticipate those moments where you would speak to us clearly and powerfully through your word to the end that our lives would be touched and challenged and changed and transformed and conformed to the very image of Christ. I pray that tonight and over the rest of our time that we have together, you would continue to break through the lies that the culture has built up. It's given us such an erroneous view of marriage, a view that has led to nothing but selfishness and destruction, and that we would see a glorious picture of what it is that you have in store for those to whom you would call to this ministry that we call marriage. We love you, and we are so grateful to you. Ask that you would burn these truths indelibly on the forefront of our minds. And we desire to hear and to heed every word you speak. We pray these things and ask these things because we believe they're in accordance with the will and the nature and the authority of Jesus the bridegroom and lover of our souls. Amen.